Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Andrea and I will be your host for today's session. I'm glad to welcome today Pavel. Uh, Pavel is a security researcher at Open Source Security and his research focuses on offensive security aspects of transient and speculative execution vulnerabilities, side channels and the effectiveness of the defensive mitigations in OSs and hypervisors. Today, Pavel will discuss a flaw recently discovered in AMD x86 processors of various microarchitectures, Zen 1, Zen 3, and Zen 3, Zen 2, and Zen 3, and its role in a speculative execution vulnerability type called straight line speculation, SLS. The presentation uh, today will consist of a 30 minute presentation followed by a 10 minute QA session. If you have any questions, please feel free to share them in the chat and we will answer them once the presentation is over. Uh, Pavel, now I would like to invite you to start your presentation. All right, um, let me share the screen. Okay, um, I hope you can see it. Yes, it's perfect. All right, so um, hi everyone. Um, today we will talk about the AMD branch mispredictor and new types and methods of uh, straight line speculation called SLS. Um, which are essentially enabled by um, the infamous AMD branch predictor. Oops. Yep, so um, my name is Paweł Wieczorkiewicz. I work as a security researcher at Open Source Security, the creators of GR Security. My focus is on low-level security research of system software and hardware, as well as reverse engineering and binary analysis. Um, today talk, um, I divided into two parts, uh, theory and practice. And in the uh, theory part, we will start by quickly skimming over the AMD microarchitecture. Then we will talk about branch predictors, what they are, what, what's their purpose, um, their building blocks and functionality. And next, um, I will try to describe the straight line speculation, um, its root cause mechanics and various types. Finally, in the practice um, section, I will talk about one of the discoveries of mine, a kind of unexpected type of SLS. And after introduction of, of the um, vulnerability, I will um, speak about details like speculation window and the limitation, limitations of it. And we will, uh, I will also show what um, successful SLS gadget um, must contain in order to, to leak some information and why sort to load forwarding feature might be um, useful there. Finally, um, I will talk about the SLS mitigations, especially the direct and indirect unconditional jumps. And um, I will also highlight why direct and indirect unconditional calls are problematic to mitigate. All right, so let's start. Um, this is a diagram of AMD Zen 2 microarchitecture I found online. And for the sake of this presentation, Let's just focus on two parts, um, the front end, yellow color, and um, back end, um, the green and red color. So let's begin by uh, talking about the front end. So what does the uh, front end really do? First of all, it fetches instructions for execution, and um, it contains various subcomponents uh, helping it to achieve this goal. For example, um, instruction cache, ITLB, next address logic, uh, et cetera. Next, uh, front end um, needs to decode uh, the fetched instructions. As you know, the x86 is a complex instruction set architecture. Um, the x86 instructions could be of um, variable lengths, various lengths. So the um, uh, job of the front end is to find the beginning and end of instruction and instructions and translate them into um, sub-instructions called uh, micro-ops. Finally, front-end dispatches the uh, decoded micro-ops to the back-end for execution. And what can we say about uh, the back-end? So back-end is a completely different beast. Um, this is the place where the micro-ops are actually executed. 
Um, one of its uh, most important properties is superscalar, uh, which means the backend is able to execute multiple microbes in parallel at every given cycle. Um, to do so, um, it uses uh, multiple of execution units. Uh, you can see the various ALUs and AGUs on the diagram. The L ALU stands for arithmetic logic unit and AGU address generation unit. Second of all, uh, the backend employs a concept of out of order execution, which means um, that the instructions or microbes arriving to the backend in program order uh, doesn't necessarily execute in, in this order, uh, which means microbes uh, that are uh, ready, which means they have uh, available execution units and their dependencies are fulfilled, are executed first. Um, that means that um, microbe are, uh, arriving later uh, with respect to the program order may get executed ahead of earlier instructions. And finally, backend um, performs the in-order retire and commit uh, of the executed um, microops, which means it tries to uh, pretend that the actual execution uh, happened in order. It makes sure that all dependencies between microops are um, fulfilled and as a whole, the program executes as the uh, instruction set defines. So we have those two, uh, blocks front-end and back-end and to summarize front-end is front-end's main job is to uh, feed uh, the the hungry beast which is back-end and sometimes um, based on the outcome of the executed um, instructions in the back-end back-end needs to inform uh, front-end um, about the, the the state of execution so and the question now is why do we need the branch prediction units in the first place well, frontend needs to know where to find next instructions to fetch and decode. And um, the task is easy for sequential execution because frontend can just fetch next instruction and that's it. However, um, the, it becomes problematic upon a control flow change um, or a branch instruction. So the frontend needs to know if the branch is taken or not, and it needs to know what is the address of the next instruction to fetch. So um, backend, as already mentioned, is um, super scalar out of order and um, fast. It can have a multiple in-flight instruction at every given moment, and it's always hungry for more. So frontend needs to uh, keep up supplying instructions to the backend. It cannot wait for the backend to get back to it with the result of evaluated branch. It has to predict what is the outcome of the branch and its target address upfront. Otherwise, it won't be able to uh, keep up supplying um, micro ops for, to the backend. If frontend predicts correctly, then everything is fine and the performance is preserved. If it mispredicts, however, uh, then there is a penalty because backend detects the misprediction and re-steers frontend to the right target address. So let's, let's talk quickly about uh, some designs of uh, the branch predictors. The simplest one is called static branch predictor and it's a sense, and, and its prediction is based on the actual branch instruction and some sort of predefined heuristic. For example, backward branches can be always considered taken, um, which may, may work well uh, for predicting loops. And conversely, the forward branches might be considered not taken. A slightly more advanced uh, branch predictor is called dynamic branch predictor. And here the prediction uh, is based on the previous results or previous outcomes of the executed branches. The idea here is that if a branch was taken before, it's likely to be taken again. And this kind of uh, branch predictors could be implemented using a single bit saturation counter, which just uh, stores one bit of information previously taken or not taken, or a two bit saturation counter, which implements a four state state machine. Here, uh, the, the previous branches uh, could have uh, four states, strongly not taken, weakly not taken, weakly taken, and strongly taken. And in order to change the overall uh, branch predictor 
prediction um, a given branch needs to be taken or not taken twice in a row. Um, a slightly more advanced um, branch predictor type is called two-level adaptive branch predictor. Um, and various variants of, of, of this design is used in the modern CPUs. It essentially contains two elements, um, branch history table, also called pattern history table, um, which is a two-dimensional table uh, whose entries are the uh, two bit saturation counters described before. And another element is branch history register, which is an n-bit shift register um, storing history of uh, executions of previous branches. So essentially it remembers an n executions of previous branches taken, not taken. And this register uh, is on the value of this register is used to index uh, the branch history table and uh, the prediction uh, final predictions and outcome of the state machine from the indexed entry. Now the uh, two-level adaptive branch predictors could be local or global. Um, in case of local, the branch history table is indexed using a distinct branch history register for each encountered conditional branch. So each branch has its own uh, register that remembers its state. In case of a global um, two-level adaptive branch prediction predictor, uh, the branch history table is indexed using a shared global branch history register, which remembers information for all encountered conditional branches. And this design might be beneficial for executing programs with many branches that uh, have the states correlated somehow. An example of uh, the two-level adaptive global branch predictor uh, is a very, a very popular G-share. Um, and the idea here is that the global, global history register value is XORed with the branch's program counter value, so address of the branch, and the outcome uh, value is used to index the branch history table. This kind of um, involves uh, the, the address of a branch within the global history uh, of the branch execution. And in the modern CPUs, uh, the you know, branch predictor unit, of course, employs many different designs and um, branch predictors using more than one um, design category are called uh, hybrid branch predictors. So, um, so far, the branch predictors we described um, have been kind of implicitly focusing on direct conditional branches. So, uh, essentially, the branch predictors were trying to answer the question if branch is taken or not taken. But uh, we know that this is not the only uh, kind of branches supported uh, on x86. So what about the other branches? Um, and do they need a branch predictor uh, at all? And the answer is, of course they do, because another job of the branch prediction unit is to predict the target address of, of the branch. And this particular um, job is done by another subcomponent of PPUs called branch target buffer. In a very simple view, um, the branch target buffer is an array um, containing entries uh, of containing entries with target addresses of encountered branches. Important information is the branch target buffer need is needed for all kinds of branches because front end fetches and decodes instructions, uh, but doesn't execute them. It has to know uh, what's where to fetch the next instructions from. And of course, as we already um, discussed, the, the back, it cannot wait for backend for its feedback. Um, that's why the branch target buffer is a component of BPU and BPU is a component of, of the front end. Now let's, uh, let's look why um, BTB is needed for all the uh, branches. So in case of direct conditional branches, a branch can be taken or not taken. If it's taken, then um, the front end's job is, is easy. It can just continue with next instruction uh, block. But when it's taken, um, we need to uh, answer the question where to. Uh, the branch can be backward, forward, um, to essentially any arbitrary um, address. And um, in case of direct unconditional branches, the situation is a bit simpler because um, the branches are always taken. However, their target still needs to be predicted. And finally, for the indirect unconditional branches, 
which are also always taken. Um, the target address needs to be predicted, especially because it can change at runtime. So it's not static and any sort of static predictions will simply not do. And to implement uh, efficiently the uh, indirect unconditional branches, the PTB becomes really crucial, right? So on this slide, um, you can see a simple artificial example of a branch predict hybrid branch predictor. Uh, there's a section responsible for answering if branches taken or not taken. And there is the PTB, uh, which answer, uh, predicts the uh, target ad address of a branch. That's enough about the branch predictors. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the straight line speculation in short SLS. So the straight line speculation term was coined by ARM and it was a result of a Google Safe Site project research, which whose CV you can see on the screen. And the initial release ARM described SLS as a speculative execution past an unconditional change in the control flow. And quoting the ARM's white paper on the topic, uh, straight line speculation would involve the processor speculatively executing the next instructions linearly in memory past the unconditional change in the control flow. Moreover, ARM stated that they were only able to see the um, SLS uh, in the context of indirect unconditional branches on their ARM CPUs, and they weren't able to reproduce the same effect on um, direct branches. Shortly after, uh, the SLS was also observed on some x86 CPUs and also in the context of indirect unconditional branches. So indirect calls, jumps, and of course, red, red run instructions. However, very likely SLS had uh, to have been observed on um, x86 CPUs a bit earlier than uh, the ARM publication mainly because uh, trapped instructions uh, blocking the SLS speculation um, appeared after red instructions circa 2018 in Microsoft Windows operating system. And as a result, also appeared in 2019 in our GR security product. All right, okay. Um, so, so far we know that SLS can occur on indirect unconditional uh, jumps, calls, and red instructions. On the screen, you can see three diagrams uh, describing the situation. Um, the um, big rectangle is simply an um, decoded instruction block, which consists of some x86 instructions the front end, is, front end is operating on. And each of the diagrams has one um, indirect unconditional branch in some place. And according to the SLS uh, definition, the following uh, the, the instructions following the branch uh, can be executed speculatively under SLS. But one may wonder, what about direct branches? Um, we were talking about indirect ones for a while. So let's see. This is basically where my little discovery uh, comes into play. Basically, it turns out that on some AMD x86 CPUs, um, Zen 1 and Zen 2 microarchitecture specifically, all direct unconditional branch instructions experience SLS vulnerability as well. So the jumps and calls with encoded target address still can be speculated over and the following um, instructions could get speculatively executed. Furthermore, branch direction doesn't really matter. Uh, forward and backward branches suffer from the SLS the same way. And what's surprising and interesting, it's even possible to trigger the SLS uh, between two co-located hyperthreads running on the same core. And interestingly, uh, the AMD x86 Zen 3 microarchitecture doesn't seem to be affected by uh, the SLS on direct unconditional branches. We know that Zen 3 microarchitecture received a relatively big design upgrade of their um, branch predictor unit. And apparently the SLS um, problem has been fixed there. One may wonder if it was intentional or accidental I don't know. My money is, however, on a happy coincidence. All right, so now uh, the, the most intriguing question. Why on earth would a sane modern CPU speculate past a direct unconditional branch, right? After all, 
um, the target is encoded, target address of the branch is encoded uh, into the as part of the instruction. So everything seems to be given on a golden plate. There is also no latency involved because the branch is unconditional. So there are no conditions to be evaluated that could contribute to, uh, to the latency. So now um, let's see why. So on this diagram, you can again see a decoded instruction block, which on AMD is 16 uh, bytes worth of x86 instruction. And the arrow indicates that there is a branch uh, instruction in it. And I explicitly didn't uh, state what kind of branch this is, direct or indirect. Uh, all we know uh, for now um, that it's uh, unconditional. But and, and it turns out that um, it doesn't matter if it's direct or indirect. So the front end operating on this decode instruction block at some point realizes that there is a branch. So it needs to predict what's the target address so it could continue. And to do so, it asks a BPU and specifically branch target buffer uh, for the target address prediction. And now it could go two ways. In a happy, um, in a happy situation, the BTB is able to predict the uh, target address correctly, and frontend can resume execution of the um, target address and fetch the new decoded instruction block and and start uh, processing it. However, in case of uh, misprediction, when BPU cannot answer the question about the um, uh, Target, about the target address, the uh, front end is in some sort of a pickle because it knows there is a branch, but it doesn't know where the branch goes to. And there is also a bunch of other instructions uh, following the branch. So um, apparently the AMD CPUs uh, decided to simply pro uh, process the code and dispatch all of the instructions, including the ones following the uh, the branch instruction as well. And some of these um, instructions dispatched for execution to the backend may actually uh, become speculatively executed by the backend. And remember that uh, backend is out of order. Um, so in such a case, um, backend, in the meantime, backend is still busy um, processing the jump instruction, but at some point it, realize, it realizes that um, their front end um, committed a misprediction. So it will, uh, first of all, um, inform front end about the misprediction, update the branch target buffer address for, for a given branch, and re steer front end to the correct um, address for the branch. And also it will um, trigger the pipeline flash, which will discard all the um, speculatively executed instructions under SLS, as well as the pending escaped instructions. However, if the speculative uh, instructions have architecturally observable uh, side effects, like for example, the memory load, you know, we can see here on the diagram, then uh, though the, the effects, the side effects could be later sensed using some sort of side channel and that could potentially lead to some um, secret information leak. And in a nutshell, this is how um, and why the straight line speculation happens. Okay, so um, what do we know? Uh, we know the, that if there is no entry into B in the BTB, uh, the given branch can be mispredicted and uh, SLS might occur. And that's true for any kind of branch. And in practice, it means that we can easily and reliably uh, make affected AMD CPUs mispredict any branch, regardless if it's direct, indirect, conditional, or, or unconditional. And we can have the uh, fo branch following instructions executed speculatively. Um, how do we do that? We essentially just need to make sure that BTB doesn't have an entry for a given branch. And the simplest way, of course, is to flash entire BTB. Now, what does the... Uh, so how to do that? Um, 
on the screen, you can see the macro I used in my experiment for flashing the, the BTV. And it looks scary, but it's actually quite simple. The idea is that if we upfront execute enough, uh, now enough con uh, unconditional branches to basically consume every entry of a BTB with um, target address of our branch. And then um, the, the previous state of, of the BTB will be flushed out and BTB will uh, be unable to uh, predict any new branches. Okay, um, now let's talk what can be achieved uh, during the SLS speculation window. So in theory, um, up to eight simple and short x86 instructions can be speculatively executed. But in practice, I uh, only managed to execute four or five short x86 instructions that uh, additionally um, do not compete uh, for execution units. And as part of those four or five instructions, two of them could be memory loads that also get executed speculatively. However, the loads, even if um, precache cannot uh, finish on time before backend realizes that there has been uh, misprediction and um, flashes the pipeline. That means uh, that the memory loads cannot provide data to uh, their dependent um, microbes. Uh, however, the loads get scheduled and at some point um, they will uh, leave the architecturally observable traces, for example, by filling the cache hierarchy with a memory cache line, changing the observable state that way. And um, when it comes to limitations, it means uh, that with this kind of SLS um, speculation, we cannot construct a full Spectre V1 gadget, mainly because the loads uh, do not finish on time. However, if um, secret data is already available in registers uh, before the SLS speculation window begins and the, the window, uh, the instructions in the window do use those registers, there is a potential for a SLS gadget that could leak um, information bits about the secret data. Alternatively, uh, I realized that uh, loads, uh, memory loads executing under SLS, receive data uh, from earlier store, stores via uh, store to load forwarding mechanism are fast enough and do finish uh, before the speculation window uh, is terminated. And thereby those loads can uh, and do provide data to the dependent microbes. And start to load forwarding is a feature of um, modern pipelines, uh, which essentially forwards data of a completed but not yet retired stores uh, to the later loads. And um, they do so because um, in order to defeat the write after write or uh, write after read dependencies, uh, the modern pipelines employ a structure called store queue, which um, buffers the, the, the pending stores. And whenever later load to the same memory address occurs, it must receive, of course, the fresh data. So it receives it either from store queue or uh, from memory. Okay, so um, now um, let's talk about uh, the SLS mitigation. We know that, uh, well, it's, it's easy to see that direct, indirect, unconditional uh, jump instructions, as well as function return instructions are somewhat easier to mitigate uh, than for instance calls. And why is that? Mainly because the execution flow um, doesn't continue uh, past the branch instruction, at least not sequentially. That means uh, we can easily put a speculative execution barrier um, that is some sort of serializing instruction, for instance, that would uh, immediately terminate uh, the, um, the speculation window there. However, for, for calls, the SLS uh, mitigation is a bit more complicated because naturally uh, the control flow resumes directly after the call instruction. Basically, at some point, the called function uh, returns and uh, uh, execution 
architectural execution um, resumes. So that means the speculative execution barrier will get executed architecturally as well. And because of that, it mustn't have any architectural side effects. So the uh, it's harder to find a suitable instruction. Uh, so getting back to the uh, jumps and reds. Um, so they, these ones are ideally mitigated using an int-free instruction, which is conveniently a single byte opcode. And um, it, it simply is a software invocation of, of a breakpoint uh, exception, and uh, which uh, changes the control flow uh, to the breakpoint exception handler. Placing such instruction after a branch is supposed to um, terminate the speculation. So here we have again the decoded instruction block um, with a jump in it, uh, followed by the int free instruction. I denoted the serializing or instruction ordering uh, capabilities of the int free by these extra bars. Um, this essentially means that the only escaped and potentially SLS executed instruction after the branch is the int free itself. The backend uh, is busy processing the, the jump instruction as well as uh, the escaped in the free instruction with its in, uh, serializing nature. And either because of the, um, either it's done processing the branch instruction and detects the misprediction or um, the in the free instruction um, triggers the pipeline flash in, in the backend. However, uh, the, the, regardless of the, the actual root cause, the reminder of the instructions following the int free instruction cannot possibly get executed. So um, this is in a very short, uh, in a nutshell, why uh, the int free mitigation is uh, successful. Okay, so now let's quickly talk about calls. So calls, as we already said, um, have to execute the, the following speculation barrier instruction. So obviously the int free with its control ha uh, um, exception handler call would not do. Um, AMD in this case recommends using Elfen's uh, instruction, which, is, which can also be made serializing on AMD. This is, however, not a very good idea for performance um, because in modern software calls are everywhere. There's plenty of them. And um, guarding each of the call sites with an L fence um, will be detrimental, detrimental to uh, performance. Um, why? Um, mainly because uh, serializing instructions deliberately slow down backend to, to wait for the prior instructions to finish. So a constant slowdown of the backend will obviously uh, slow down the, remove the, the, the performance, decrease the performance. Another interesting uh, mitigation, however, is um, the X or EAX, EAX, which essentially zeroes out the EAX. It's both complicated and kind of countering. So um, you may wonder why would the Zorin EAX work in the first place? Well, it's the idea is based on a compiler post call behavior assumptions. Um, the way uh, the, the compiler lays uh, the code uh, after the call instruction. So in the, for example, the call clobbered registers will not be used by the compiler um, after the call without a prior rewrite, which means uh, that the called function modifies uh, some registers, the, the clobbered ones, and the compiler is unable to reason about their state. So it has to reload it uh, before using it. And this reload will essentially um, render those registers rather un uninteresting for uh, the SLS gadget uh, exploitation because um, they cannot execute uh, speculatively with the previously undefined value. On the other hand, um, the Coli preserved registers are preserved, which means um, the value doesn't change before and after the call. And as such, uh, if there is no um, other software bugs, uh, the, the, their usefulness for SLS gadget exploitation is also fairly limited. So what is left is the uh, return value register, the EAX on um, x86. This one um, 
might be abused um, because the speculative execution under the SLS may um, run and execute instructions with the value of the EX before the call. However, if we clear uh, the EX register before the call, setting it to some uninteresting value like zero, the usefulness of these registers in um, SLS uh, gadget will also be reduced to zero. And why this mitigation is complicated? Um, basically, it's based on compiler assumptions and the assumptions might not always hold. They are kind of compiler implementation dependent. Uh, furthermore, some calling convention ABIs use EAX as function input parameter, like fast call, for example, or regparm free. Also, variadic functions may use EEX as an input parameter. And of course, if AX is used as input parameter, we cannot zero it out willy-nilly uh, before calls. Uh, in addition to that, um, some small structures tend to be returned from functions uh, using a combo of EAX and EDX registers, which means we have to also take care of EDX register sometimes. And uh, we cannot do that for the same reason as before, because EDX might be, and usually is a function input parameter. And last but not least, uh, there is an indirect call using EAX register as its operand specifying the target address. And obviously we cannot zero out uh, the EAX register before uh, this instruction as well. So I hope now you understand why this mitigation is kind of complicated to apply in practice. However, it definitely uh, provides better uh, performance. It has better performance over the elephants instruction. And because of this reason, this is what we used in our GR security product. All right, uh, thank you very much um, for listening to me. If you are interested in more details about this topic, feel free to, to read the uh, two blog posts I, I wrote about this. And in case of any questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Thanks. Thank you very much, Pavel, for the presentation. Um, are there any questions? If you have any questions, please share them uh, in the chat box and uh, Pavel will uh, answer them shortly. And the question is, the gadget must be in the 16 bytes fetched block. That's correct, yes. That's correct. And ideally it has to be within this sub part of the SLS executed instructions. All right. Thank you. Thank you for answering the question. Uh, thank you, Pavel, again for uh, doing this presentation for us. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.